Okay, let us begin. There, let us begin. Let us, let us begin. I guess it is on, right? Yep, I can this. Okay. Um, we'll begin with prayer, and then we're looking at we're finishing up Acts chapter fourteen, which is where we were three weeks ago when I was here on the back page of that. So we'll we'll begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for calling us and our families into your church, into the body of Christ. And as we now see the church being planted in all the Gentile lands and cities, we pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit as we contemplate the gifts of the church in our own generation. And we pray for the gospel to go forth to our own neighbors. In your son's holy name we pray and give all thanks. Amen. Okay, we're at Acts 14. I guess, first of all, let me make a quick note on vacation. We went up to Michigan and saw Elaine's family and all that. I'm not going to report on that. Um, but I thought you, you might like to just hear, we, that means that driving up to Michigan, we drove through Fort Wayne. And driving through Fort Wayne, we saw our two seminarians, Mark Schomburger and Rob Doty. We actually stayed at the Doty house for um, two nights, I guess it was, and went out, um, well, we went out to a brew pub and had dinner, and then a couple other things like that. But I guess it's, um, what, Rob and Emily, they're both doing great. Emily is in her, in her job now, new job in Fort Wayne of, um, for a, major accounting firm there in Fort Wayne. I say major only because we saw the building and it looks, it, it, it doesn't look like some accountants working out of the basement. How's that? Um, so Emily's really enjoying it. And then also with Marsh and Rachel, um, you know, Rachel's doing her accounting business um, and I think they're really enjoying it. But in talking to both Rob and Marsh, they are both really enjoying studying the theology. They're appreciating the, um, the teaching that they're receiving at seminary, and I think they're really having a fun time. So just, just, just to report on that. Unfortunately, the seminary was not very active while we were there. We were there on, what, a Friday and a Saturday, and it's kind of between after a summer course is shut down, I guess, and then waiting for the next the next uh, academic courses to begin. So we walked through the campus but didn't really see much action there. But anyway, any, um, on all that, any questions about our seminaries or anything like that since we'll be looking at Office of Ministry today? Right. Well, I, I will mention that. So while they're there, Rob, when you go to seminary, and this was true for me too, when I went a few years ago, seven or eight years ago, um, while, you're, while you're in seminary, those first two years, you have a fieldwork congregation that you serve in. And that just means you help the pastor, you'll participate in the liturgy if needed, you may take some of the Bible classes here and there, but you're just sort of getting your feet wet and, and seeing what the, the ministry is weekly in a church. For Marsh, for Pastor Schomberger, he does not have that because he's already ordained. So field work wouldn't really make sense. But that does mean that Pastor Schomberger is able to preach some as pastors need help, um, I guess for vacations and all. And like Carol said, he went to, I forget, what did you say, Gary, Indiana? And I don't, is that two hours? It's, it's no, it's much further than that. For the, okay. Yeah. Uh, but, but Marsh was preaching for a pastor there in Indiana um, today, and he will be in coming weeks too, here and there. As, yeah. as, Next um, week too, in Gary. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. And, and then, then okay, yeah. And then Rob Doty will be preaching as a fieldwork student when the pastor that he's still working under asks him to. That every pastor does it a little differently. Um, but that also means 
that when they come home, I mean, we know Pastor Schomburger because he's already ordained. We can look forward to hearing the sermon from him. But that also means we can tag Rob Doty and ask him to preach a sermon. So we can, we can fill out reports and tell him what needs work. Or, or maybe we can just be nice and encouraging. But anyway, so a little report from, from Fort Wayne. Um, Acts chapter 14, and we've gone through the account of Paul and Barnabas. That's where they were identified as being Zeus and Hermes until they let the people know that no, they were not gods. They were servants of Christ Jesus. And now we're looking at Paul being stoned. This is beginning at verse 19. So Acts 14, verse 19. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city, and on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord, they committed to the Lord in whom they had believed. Okay. So, any, well, for, for where we are, if you remember in Paul's travels, these cities that we're looking at are called, in scripture, they will be called Gentile or Greek, uh, depending on which translation. But you and I can remember that this is the area that we today think of as Turkey. Back then it was of the Greek Empire, and they didn't have, the, the word Turkish came up many, what, the word Turkish came up around the year 1200 AD, if I remember right. So there was no view of Turkey in that way. So, like Ephesus is a major city in that area, um, Iconium, Lystra, uh, Antioch is down at the border or toward the border of Turkey and Syria for what you and I think of it today, but we can remember that that's where Paul was trained up under Gamaliel, the, the rabbi, although it's a Greek city, it's not a city of Israel, it's way north of that. So it's where there was a rabbinic school uh, up in that area. So that's the area we're playing around in, what you and I would think of as Western Turkey going into Syria. Um, and now the notes, Paul is proclaiming Jesus of Nazareth as being the promised Messiah. The Jews who want to live by the law realize the threat. Paul must be stopped. And stoning is the proper penalty. So a false prophet in the Levitical law is stoned to death. If Paul is a false prophet, then that, that's where they would be bringing that in. Remember, we've made a note on this before, but when we see the word Jews here, just to keep that clear in our minds, this is not a racial term. They didn't have that concept at that time. That came to us after the Enlightenment, many centuries later. But in the case of the Jews, it comes from the word Judaite, which is the Jews around Jerusalem. It's those brought back from Babylon and Persia, those people of faith who built the new temple according to the direction of the Lord. And now by the time Jesus comes, and we have the book of Acts after Jesus ascends, this word Jew is used, we can say, in two different ways then. It's of someone who belongs to Israel. That's Jesus is a Jew. The 12 apostles are Jews. Mary is a Jew, et cetera, et cetera. Or it can also, the same word can also be used referring to a theological party. We might even think a theological slash political party. That would be the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the scribes. So they're called the Jews. So when Jesus says 
that you Jews say this, but I say this. He's speaking of them as a theological party. That's the way we see it being, being used here. So for us, we can just think these are the teachers of the law, these are the Pharisees, or the derivative of them as they, they go up into to, um, Asia Minor, what we think of as Turkey and all that. So now looking at some of the verses I have marked there, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul writes, and now remember Corinth is up in Greece. It's the next major city over from Athens. So he's writing to the Corinthians, but he's speaking of all of his travels around the Greek world, including around um, what we call Turkey. Paul writes, from the time, from, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. So there we can see the suffering of the Christian. And look at the way Paul lists all that. It comes from Gentiles. What would, that, what would a Gentile be to you and me? It would be anyone outside of the faith, anyone outside of the church. Um, so it would be in our own world, in our secular world, those who are opposed to the church and the church will suffer at their hand. But the suffering also, the peril, as he says here, comes in things of the world, like in journeys, perils of the water, perils of robbers, but then also perils of my own countrymen. So that would be his fellow, Paul's fellow Jews, who are using their Jewishness as a way to try to act like they're more legitimate than he is. Um, but also Paul lists, he ends that list with in, in perils among false brethren. So this is for us to remember too that the persecution of the church is not just the persecution of those Muslims murdering Christians on the shore of um, Libya. Remember that from a couple years ago. Or Christians being murdered elsewhere right now around the world. It is that. But as Paul says, it's perils among false brethren. So we can remember how the church suffers because of false teaching. And this does bring a seriousness to it. Of, um, I mean, when you watch someone like, well, Ash and I have joked about, I think his favorite non-Lutheran pastor is Kenneth Copeland, right? Um, but, so it, I mean, it, in one way it may be worthy of a joke, um, and, and that's a way to put things in good order sometimes, but we can remember there's a seriousness to this because you have someone like Kenneth Copeland who is teaching things that are opposed to the gospel. He's calling himself a Christian. He will talk about the Holy Spirit ten times in the same sentence. He'll talk about Jesus Christ. He is not preaching the forgiveness of sins. He is not preaching the sinner standing justified by the free grace of Christ. He's preaching a gospel that's based on power that God is giving him. And if we get tied in with him, we can get that power too. And what we want to make, what we want to keep clear for ourselves and our families is this is not a, a disagreement among Christians about how to worship or what, what um, clothing to wear for the pastor or something. This is false doctrine brought into the church and by it, Satan is bringing doubt and despair in his church, bringing a legalism of having people look at each other and try to figure out who has more Holy Spirit than the next person, as if the Holy Spirit is some sort of weird quantity of coffee or something. And so the seriousness of it that Paul gives it of, I've been persecuted by fellow brethren, people who call themselves Christian, we can read into it, what, they've been baptized, they come to the service of the Lord's house, and yet they're persecuting the gospel. 
Any thoughts or questions? Okay. Uh, next, Galatians. He, oh, as, as Ash says, he does have a nice jet. That, that's one of the, if you look at Kenneth Copeland, and you can see this online on YouTube and all, he had to have an, I don't what was it, $25 million Gulfstream jet. Was it 25 million? I don't even remember. Um, because he couldn't fly, and he used this term, he couldn't fly in the regular airlines that, that, that we do because he can't, when he's a preacher of the gospel, now remember, gospel does not mean to him what it means to Paul or what it means to us. Gospel just means I'm a preacher of God's word, and whatever I say in God's word is, that's what it is. I, but because he's a preacher of the gospel, he can't fly on regular uh, airlines because they are a tube of demons. So think about that next time you get on a jet. <laughs> I thought that was more <laughs> I know. I know it's one of those. It's so laughable, and, and Ash and I do laugh. I mean, we were actually sending each other video. It was so insane. And like I said, it's worthy of being laughed at. Uh, derision is one of the things that the prophets would use. They would, they would use humor, sarcasm, derision, to laugh at the false preachers. Remember how Elijah on the uh, Mount Mount Carmel, when when he had all the false prophets of Baal there, and he starts going, well. Why can't your God, Baal, bring down fire from the sky? And after all, remember, Baal is the, the God of lightning and thunder. So for Baal to bring down fire from the sky to, to light their sacrifice should not be a big deal. That's what Baal does, if you believe in Baal. But I liked it. It was very derisive and sarcastic. Well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe your God, Baal, is asleep. Why don't, you, why don't you bang the drums more and dance some more? Because the, the, the rumbling will wake him up. And he just went, he kept driving further and further into the sarcasm. So I, I think it's right to use sarcasm when we see something like a Kenneth Copeland. He is worthy of derision. But at the same time we're doing it, the way that the Baal prophets were actually taking people away from the altar of Jerusalem, the altar of sins forgiven, by the blood promised by God and taking them to a false altar that promised power for your family. In that same way, Kenneth Copeland is taking people who need to hear the word of Christ. They have respect for the scriptures. And instead of telling them Christ crucified for the forgiveness of your sin, you are justified before the Father. Instead of telling them that, he's telling them how if they give X amount of seed money, they're going to get tenfold money back, and they're going to have more power in their lives. So just for us to remember as a church, there really is a reason we want to say we will preach the true gospel of Christ Jesus. We will not preach the wisdom of men, and when we do, we should be repentant. We should ask our Lord's forgiveness for, for, for that. But I would like to have that bell string. If, if you'd like to bring that up to the next council meeting. So. Okay. Galatians 6.17, Paul writes, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And then 2 Timothy 3.11, Paul writes, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, note the care that the apostles give to the church. Having planted the church at Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, they are now bound to these people, returning to them to strengthen and encourage them, preparing them for faith's life of tribulation. So any thoughts or questions on that or, or persecution in the church? Then let me read one note from um, Luther. 
about persecution. Okay, Luther is making a comment on Psalm 118. If you, if you have a Bible, you can look this up to see what Luther does with this verse. Psalm 118, verse 12. The psalmist writes, they surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Okay. Here's what Luther notes on that. Again, in Psalm 118, verse 12, where we say in German, quote, they are stamping and quenching as a fire in the thorns. The rabbis put it this way. Oh, I didn't read the verse with the thorns in it. No, I did. Okay. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. Okay. So, the rabbis, Luther writes, put it this way. They are dying out or being extinguished like fire in the thorns. Now, this is supposed to mean that the godless persecutors are like the thorns ignited under a pot, which blaze and flash furiously. But before the meat in the pot is done, the thorns have burned themselves out, being extinguished, and left the meat quite raw. So the persecutors perish before they have consumed the righteous. Wherever they can, the rabbis thus apply the scripture to put their pots and sacrifice. Okay, so, and then oh, Luther said, because the text goes on to say, in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. The same words which occur also in the two preceding verses. And because these words tell us how the godless shall perish, we hold the view given by our rendering of the text that here is expressed the great fury of the adversaries against the righteous. Just as in the same verse, the psalmist compares the godless to angry bees, so here he compares them also to people who come running to put out a fire when a field hedge or forest is burning. The, well, I won't go on, but you can see how Luther is explaining that, that these persecutors come around as if putting out a fire. They come as swarming of bees, and yet the church perseveres. They never get it accomplished. And so we can look at the persecutions of the church throughout the ages, where the church is being really heavily persecuted at places in Libya, at places in Ethiopia, in China, and at other times in history, it was elsewhere. And yet, they do great damage, they cause great harm, they kill many Christians, but they never get the church put out. They never get their job accomplished. And, and we can remember that, that even now the church is being persecuted in America, not by violence of sword, but by violence of threat in the, in the secular world's conversation. In other words, you will be canceled if you say certain things or whatever. We can lament that that's happening. We will maybe see no rescue in the church in our own generation before we are called home to our Lord. But we can know that the church will persevere. It will, it, it will never be successful. Any questions? Thoughts on persecution? Okay. Then let's look a little bit at, Paul talks about Going back to Acts chapter 14, that section ending at verse 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So uh, a note on this word, elder, talked about this before, but it's worth us remembering that this word elder is used by Paul to refer to the office of pastor, the, the office of holy ministry. And I say that's worth us remembering because, of course, 
in the church now, as Lutherans, we generally refer to a man in the office of holy ministry as a pastor, um, sometimes maybe as a minister, sometimes as a father. Luther himself would use the word father for the pastoral office at times. Um, we don't use the word elder for pastor. In, in, instead, we're using elder for an office that is not of the holy ministry. In other words, it's not appointed, instituted and appointed by the Lord, but it's an office that we create to help the pastor, which is fine, as long as we keep that in, clear in our mind that we created this office. It's not in scripture that we must have a board of elders or something like that. In some Lutheran churches, I've heard lately more of them, I guess, are kind of using the word of board of deacons or something like that. So what we want to remember is when we read the word elder in scripture, it's coming from the Greek word presbyter, which later we get the word like Presbyterian or something like that. But this elder refers to the pastoral office so that when Paul is out there planting the church, he will then ordain a man or some men into the office of pastor, the office of elder. And I'll mention one other thing. We think of elder as, well, as the first referent would be someone who is an elder, someone who is um, over, I don't know, what, 50? What would make a person an elder person in the church? That's kind of the way we treat that word. And yet Paul is ordaining men who are young. Well, he'll ordain men who are older and younger. But in other words, it, the, the, the gauge of being an elder as the office of pastor is not how old you are, it's in the office. And part of the thought of that is maybe we're treating this word wrong, maybe because of the way it's, it stands out in English as elder, elderly, things like that. But the word coming from presbyter, the first reference for a presbyter is not of his age in the community. It's of his office. In so in other words, presbyter is used outside the church also. Presbyter refers to a person sitting in the office of being on a council. So think of a council, like our church council when we meet and, and make decisions or whatever. So in that way, it's a council member, a councilman. And you'll see this, for instance, in the book of Revelation, where we'll talk about the throne of God, the council of heaven, and the presbyters around the throne. So that a pastor, this office of holy ministry then, if you think of the conversation in heaven between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, where the Father sends forth the Son to justify us from our sins, the Son, ascends to the Father, and the Father and the Son send forth the Holy Spirit. The Holy, we believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. What does the Holy Spirit bring to us? When I go to my Father, Jesus says, I will send to you the Holy Spirit, and he will keep you in my words. So the Holy Spirit brings to us the Word. The gospel. Now what word is that? Well Jesus says the words I speak to you are not my words but the words of the Father who sent me. So the Father speaks to the Son. The Son in conversation with his Father says I have justified the sinner. I present the blood of atonement to the heavenly throne. The Father and the Son send forth the Holy Spirit to bring this justification on earth. But remember, this is described as a council. It has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in ongoing conversation, even back at the time of creation. And then when creation falls into sin, it becomes a conversation of redemption of the sinner. And what's around the council? All the angels and archangels. And the prophet is brought into this council to go and speak to Israel before Jesus comes. But after Jesus comes, there's no prophet at this council anymore because Jesus is the prophet at the council. So he sends forth the Holy Spirit with the word of gospel. And now 
we are to understand a man called into the office of holy ministry as being a presbyter, someone who has these words of the council, of the council chamber in heaven, which means when a pastor steps into the pulpit, or whenever, not, not even just physically in the pulpit, but when he's, in, when he's speaking from the pastoral office, he is to be speaking nothing other than the word of Christ crucified. And if he is speaking something other than that word, then he is speaking against the office that he's in, that, that he's been made a council member of. Did that make sense? Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't include things when the pastor is not speaking in the office, of course. When I'm giving Ash a hard time for driving an English car, that's outside the office of ministry. It still is right, <laughs> but it's not right by the authority of God. <laughs> Okay, so looking at some of the scripture verses for the office of pastoral, the pastoral ministry. And again, I mentioned, you know, seeing, uh, we, we, we visited with um, Pastor Schomburger and, and then uh, seminarian Rob Doty, who will shortly be a pastor in a couple of years. So keep that in mind. Up here we have these two men being trained up for the office of holy ministry. And Why? And that it's in Paul's words that we can see why it is that we should be taking this seriously, why it is we should be rejoicing that there are men called into this office and being trained up um, in the, Paul, Paul speaks of it as my doctrine, Paul's doctrine, in other words, the apostolic doctrine. And remember how in the book of Acts we've already looked at a number of times it's spoken of as the doctrine of the apostles. So what is it that... Marsha Schomburger and Rob Doty should be learning at that seminary, it better be the doctrine of the apostles. Um, and, and I think we can have full confidence it is, but I mean, that's, that's why you send them there. Um, I have a question about, and I'm thinking about Marsh, because this reminds me of you know, the specific, the SMP, mm -hmm. specific ministry pastor, and then you've got Rob at the general seminary. What was the Marsh? Uh, okay. Was he ordained? In other words, okay, he goes to the seminary now to complete a theological, and he'll be ordained well, as a general pastor. So is that, what did you do to Marsh to get him as an SMP for your congregation? You know, what kind of action, or was it coordination, was it installation? Was it we, we, just pat, we just passed a resolution at a council. No. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what, well, that's what it was I'm trying to do. But then, um, so now, he's a little different than Rob at the right. seminary because he has been SMP. So, so some of you have been through this before, but maybe some of you haven't, and, and this is something that we should be um, very clear on. What, what, what actually is going on with, um, as a man is brought in the office of ministry, when is it that you call a man a pastor? I'll say it another way. I'll say all it that. a way. You put the body and blood of the Lord into the hands of Marsh, whereas Rob has not had that yet. Yeah, and so Pastor Barnett's mentioning, because I'm sure that we've had in this conversation before, and that is some language that I've used, um, apart from Marsh Schomburger and Rob Doty, so to get to that in a second, but we had a bit of a mess in our synod, I'll say, where we had a number of so-called offices. And I say so-called not just to be sarcastic, but to make a distinction of when we're speaking of the office of holy ministry, that is not so-called. That is put in place, instituted by our Lord. And the apostles then are teaching that. We in the church can go and create our own offices. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as we're clear, it's not the office of the holy ministry. In other words, we create an office of head trustee. That's good. Um, an office of, you can think of other things. But in the church then, for some decades, we were sort of being loose in our language. Maybe not we in this room, but where we had lay minister pastors. 
and we would actually use the word lay minister. Well, now think about that. A lay minister, how, how does that make any sense at all? Lay means you're not office of holy ministry. Minister means you are. And now if I say I'm a lay minister, what have I just told you? I, I, yeah, I'm not sure what, I've told you kind of just in general what I wanted to tell you without telling you what might get me in trouble or something like that. So we had all this, uh, the office of lay ministry, office of lay deacons, office of, we had about um, five or six other terms. I, I'm not remembering them right now. So what, about six years ago, I think it was when we had a convention Missouri City Convention, and they tried to clean this up, and I think they did a good job under the circumstances, because things like this are very hard to clean up. When you have one district, Florida, Georgia, that has an office of lay minister, you have another district that, that invented some office of such and such, uh, and, and you can't, there's no, there's no way to understand any continuity, it's just a, a mess. So there was a convention, I'll say six years ago, Maybe it was nine, I don't remember. And what they said is we will have the office of S, not, not the office, we'll have a, a program called SLP, Pacific Ministry Pastoral. Because the argument that some were making for lay ministers was what do you do when you have something like, let's say in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, Let's say there's a group of Lutherans meeting. They are rejoicing in the Lord's word. They're serious about the doctrine. They need a pastor, but it's a few families and there's no way that a pastor can even be close to being afforded there. And maybe it's actually too far to be reasonably traveled to in a, by a circuit rider type thing. So then the argument comes, well then we should have a lay minister there. And he can preach and administer the sacrament but he'll do it under the authority of, say, Pastor Graff up in Albuquerque. So I'm the, it's my ordination, and I'm transporting it to him for those days, or something like that. Now, I will tell you, Pastor Graff up in Albuquerque would not go along with that, but, but that's kind of what was happening. So SMP was the convention's way of saying, let's clean all these programs up, all these people in all these 17 various half offices of ministry will have, I don't remember, but I'll say five years to, to sign into the SMP program. Well, the language that Doug used and, and that, I had, that I had used was that we should not put the body and blood of our Lord Jesus into the hands of a man if we don't trust ourselves to put our hands on his head. And I think that that's a distinction that Paul shows us when Paul says to Timothy, don't lay hands quickly on any man. In other words, when I went to say the ordination of Pastor Schaller, at, um, that the young pastor at Faith in Christ, he was ordained two years ago, I don't remember. Um, but he's very young and, and he was, I mean, he's right out of Fort Wayne Seminary. He's being ordained. And so you get the elders, as Paul says, the laying on of hands of elders. So you get the, el the surrounding pastors, the pastors of the circuit, and other pastors that can, if there's a pastor up in Denver who knows him, he could come down and lay hands on him too. But Paul says, do not lay your hands quickly on any man. So that does bring a burden to me as a pastor to have a reasonable knowledge of what this man's... Um, qualifications are for the office of ministry. Now, we sort of answer that in our in our synod by having the seminaries, because then you can call, and, and I did, I spoke to two professors about Schaller, who knew him and had him in classes, and they were both um, very excited about him, um, very positive. So even though I hadn't studied any theology with Schaller, men who I know and trust have trained him up and say he's good and worthy and he's, he's qualified for the office of ministry. 
So I easily lay hands on Pastor Jordan Shallow. That's good. But now you're going to ask me to lay hands on some lay minister out somewhere, and I'm not sure how he learned his theology. Maybe he has good theology. Maybe he doesn't. Has he sat at the feet of some good teachers that have shown him how you treat these Greek words and these Hebrew words? I don't know. Paul says, don't lay your hands quickly on any man. So should I lay my hands on him, which means I'm putting into his hands the body and blood of Christ. And I don't even know if the guy knows law and gospel. So that's where that comes in of um, let's have a good, well-ordered way of laying our hands on men who have been trained in a very healthy way in the gospel. They know law and gospel. They know not to get in the pulpit and use the pulpit to try to beat people with the law as if that will make them better Christians. They know to use the pulpit for the cleansing of sins, the justification of the sinner. So with SMP, then the attempt was... Well, did you lay your... Okay, just to get to the short of it, did you lay your hands in this terminology? Did you lay your hands upon Marsh? Okay, I, let me get there for once, in one second then, about why Marsh was SMP. Because it's a, it's a different story. It's a unique story. Because Marsh was already ordained in the Southern Baptist Convention. Oh, okay, you would go there. So, okay, so, so SMP is set up for all these, these pastors out there who have been trained up, maybe, but kind of, but we don't know, etc. It gives them a way to go through this program at the seminary where they show up at the seminary for um, a number of classes for like um, two or four week long intensives, but then they're taking classes with the same professors online. Now, I don't like that way of teaching, and I'm not sure that's the best, but that was the way that the, the attempt to sort of give good order to this, so that now if a man is an SMP pastor, he has not gone to the seminary and learned Greek and Hebrew, but he has learned from the professors law and gospel and the administration of the sacraments in such a way that they, I'll say, sign off on him. This man is well trained in this gospel ministry. Now comes along Marsh, and for those of you who don't remember how the, but what I first met Marsh when he came, when he was a pastor at Calvary Chapel. He had been ordained in the Southern Baptist Convention. So obviously, Marsh at that point, Pastor Schomburger, is not teaching good law and gospel. He is not teaching that Jesus can baptize babies. He's teaching Jesus can't baptize babies. That's why you're a Baptist pastor, after all. Um, he's not teaching the body and blood for the forgiveness of your sin. But Marsh brought over to our, in this room here at Grace, he brought over a handful of youth from Calvary Chapel, because remember, we had brought in Gene V, who wrote The Spirituality of the Cross and wrote a book on vocation. So maybe some of you remember that. Gene Veith was right here, and we had a, what, a Friday and Saturday seminar. I don't remember how we did it. All of our congregation was invited. Other Lutherans were invited. But we also sent out the invitation to some other churches. Marsh brings over some youth from Calvary Chapel, and they hear Gene Veith on talking about vocation. And then Marsh and I start going out and having coffee together uh, at Starbucks and things, talking theology. And Marsh had some real questions about what he was, in other words, Marsh is teaching that Jesus cannot give his true body and blood. Again, he's a Southern Baptist pastor. He better be teaching that. That's, what it, that, that's the way you're trained up. And yet he's reading at the same time the words of Scripture, this is my body, this is my blood. And the two, what he's preaching and what the apostles are putting in scripture, don't meet up. And then other things too, like the um, um, true body and blood, oh, the justification of the sinner. And I'll tell you another one, and, and I'll say this because I've heard Marsh talk about it, so this isn't just in his and my private conversation. He's talked about it uh, publicly. 
Marsh is a rock and roll player, right? He's 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 uh, he, he he's he's very he's very talented with a guitar, with a trumpet, with a uh, with, on on keyboard, and he was in a rock and roll band, and he plays. Uh, he and Rachel even play rock, or maybe you'd say folk rock type music, sometimes at a bar or something. But as a Baptist, your music is to, all, is to be praising God. Can you go to a bar and sing a song about, um, I don't, I'll, I'll say it because it's a song that Carol and I have talked about, could, could, could Marsha go to a bar and sing Me and Bobby McGee? Oh, that's a big song. You should be able to sing that. But it's not praising God. What, windshield wipers slapping time? And, you know, that, how do you get to... And so what Marsh was able to grab onto with the doctrine of vocation is we are Christians in the church. We hear our Lord's gospel. We receive his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. But now if I'm... If, I'm a, if I work at the tire store, my vocation is to put good tires on cars and keep families safe. But it's not to write Jesus on all the tires. <laughs> right? I should treat people honorably, and when given opportunity, I should converse with them and speak to them of the gifts of Jesus when given opportunity. But I'm not a Christian tire person. I, I would want to be a good, honorable, tire person in Albuquerque so that people can trust me. What about a musician? You're not a Christian musician. You're a musician who has faith in Christ. Should you be able to sing, we get our kicks on Route 66, without somehow artificially putting God into it? Of course. And, and do the best job you can. So Marx found great freedom in that, that he had not known in the Baptist church, that in our vocational life, we do our vocation as gifts to our neighbor, but not as some false idea of artificial evangelism by putting on Jesus buttons and walking into the lumber yard or something like that. So Marx, the problem that that, that presented us here at Grace with, but also the Senate, the Senate, because I had to call Herb Mueller, the first vice president of the Senate at that time, and Herb Mueller, the first vice president of the Senate in our bylaws or constitution, however that, is the one responsible for colloquizing men into the office, into the pastoral ministry of the Lutheran ministerial. In other words, if a Roman Catholic priest becomes Lutheran, how do you colloquize them into the Lutheran ministerial? That problem belongs to the first vice president of Senate, of figuring, figuring out what, um, how to, what council to meet with and all that. So I, when I called him and said, we have this Mark Schomburger and his wife, Rachel. They have gone through catechism here at Grace. Um, they, are, they are communing with us. They are of our doctrine, of the doctrine of the apostles. They are Lutheran. And he's, a, he's an ordained pastor. Not ordained in the Lutheran ministerium, but into, but, and yet we can't say that a Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Roman Catholic has not had hands laid on them in the church, maybe a church with much false doctrine, but it is a church confessing Christ Jesus crucified. They may have doctrine that steals from that, and that's lament, like a Roman Catholic priest is confessing the same creed that we just confessed uh, an hour ago in the Lord's service. Unfortunately, he's also preaching things like purgatory, which steal from the comfort of that creed, but we can't take away from it that he is confessing the creed, and he is a pastor of that. So with Mark Schomburger, it was, he's an ordained pastor, and, and I spoke to her, to Herb Mueller in, in uh, two fairly long conversations where he was trying to figure this out too. What do we do? And that's where in conversation then also with Marsh, it was let's put him through the SMP program. The SMP program was not created for this purpose.
but Herb Mueller thought this would be the best way to track Marsh into the Lutheran ministry. But then with honor his ordination, his well, Baptist ordination. So when he was installed as a pastor here at Grace, in a way you could say that was by a in a in a way by a necessity. Not that we have him as pastor here, but in other words, as Lutherans, we take ordination very seriously, as we should. So he was installed as a pastor here. We did not lay hands on him. We did not ordain him. So when he graduates from the Fort Wayne Seminary as a general, qualified to be a general pastor in any congregation, right. uh, would it be safe to say then that we will not be laying hands upon him? Correct. Whereas we would be with Rob Doty. Correct. So Rob Doty is going through the same seminary track uh, that I did. Well, that you did, where you go for two years academic studies at St. Louis or Fort Wayne. I barely remember. You, you go, well, and I think some of the professors would say maybe there's good reason for that. But, <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> and, and then you go out for internship for a year, which we call a vicarage, and then you return to the seminary for your last academic year, um, and now you have your Master of Divinity and then you go through this call process and so that four years from now, well, three years from now, I guess, sort of, I guess with Rob, because of where he is in that, um, he will, there'll be a call service at the seminary and they will call his name, it'll be, you know, Rob Doty to whatever, St. Peter Lutheran Church in such and such South Dakota or something like that. Now, there are other things with that. I mean, that's the way it will work. There's other things with that, because as you know, the, the presumption sort of is that the Rocky Mountain District President would want to um, keep him in the Rocky Mountain District, unless you have a seminarian. If, if Rob and Emily say that we would really like to serve in on the East Coast, I don't see Rob and Emily saying that, but. Um, but in a way, we could presume, hopefully, that he comes back to the Rocky Mountain District. But there's a lot of conversation. Well, I, like I went to the Michigan District, even though I had no family, of, of no, no grafts that ever lived on that side of the Mississippi, which my dad made clear to me. <laughs> um, but when, you're, when your bride is from Michigan, then, you know, that's, that's not a an unwise way to, to go about it. So, anyway, is that? Well, okay, now I'll take him out of it. If you're just an SMP guy, or somebody had become an SMP, let's say he had never had that Baptist ordination, and he'd come here and become an SMP, would he have been ordained? Yes. The way the SMP, and this is where some of, I, I, I would not, I don't think the SMP is set up in the best way for this. I, still, I'm very thankful for SMP. Be because it cleaned up a real, the mess it cleaned up was really bad. And SMP is a good, healthy track forward from that. But the way SMP would work, apart from the way it did for Schomburger, but if we were to take a layman in our congregation and say he should be an SMP pastor here. By the way, we should not do that. I, I will, because SMP was set up for churches that were a specific ministry that could not have a normal pastor. Now here at Grace, it's like, if we're gonna take Ash and say, well, let's make you an SMP pastor, why? We have a pastor. If, if I get run over by a bus, Grace can call another pastor. What, what are we trying to pull by saying, let's have four SMP pastors? I just wanna be clear, Acts 14 brought up the question because you've got Paul going through these congregations who are then laying hands on men who are not going to get a master of divinity academic degrees, but persons in those churches to be pastors okay, I'll, in the church. I'll, I'll make a note on that. Because I, I, by the way, we're, we're a little off the text, but in a way I think not, because we're talking about the Office of Holy Ministry, and this really is a critically important thing um, for churches to understand 
what it means. I mean, why don't we just call three men in here right now and go, let's walk into the sanctuary and ordain them right now. Why not? And so it's worth us actually, we know that that would not be good, but why? And so it's worth us thinking about. Paul talks about a man being strong in the word. That's one of the, so when you look at the books of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus, those are called the pastoral epistles, where Paul is writing about these young pastors, Pastor Timothy and Pastor Titus. And he's telling them, like Timothy is in Ephesus, and Paul is telling Timothy, raise up other men. To, ordain, to lay hands on them. Get, go find the guys that, are, that can be trained up. But to train them up, they obviously didn't have Fort Wayne or, or St. Louis, but Paul is talking about being strong in the word. So how did Paul train a man for the office of holy ministry? Well, we don't know, we don't know exactly, but we know that Paul came from the rabbinic tradition we, which would not be unlike our seminaries, because in the rabbinic tradition, you don't just learn the writings of the rabbis, you're learning the wisdom of the world too. You're learning the Greek philosophers, which is why Paul is so strong in Greek philosophy. He, he's able to quote philosophers just without even thinking about it. So how did Paul tell Timothy to train up the pastors? Was it to meet with them for three years? I, we, we don't know. But we do know that before you lay hands on a man to make sure that he's not given to, to anger, he's not given to um, uh, drinking, he's a husband of one wife, um, he's apt to teach, he's strong in the word, which for Paul would have meant, obviously, um, he knows how to read Hebrew. Obviously, he knew how to read Greek, because that'd be like reading English now, but he, he knew how to read Hebrew, he could translate the prophets. So there was this setup of this academic track of some order, whether it was Timothy and three other pastors that Paul had trained meeting with them, who knows, but train them up well and then lay hands on them, not quickly, but after this careful um, um, attention to, to, to all of this. So now in Missouri Synod, what we're doing with seminaries is not because God said he's there two seminaries for a church body this size, but we should take seriously to train up a man well, to train him up in the, the wisdom of the world, in the way of, um, he should know something about the conversation of our world, about the philosophers, about how to read the times, that First Chronicles talks about those men who can read, read the times around them. So a pastor should be able to read what's going on in America. Not that he understands it all, but, but he should be cognizant of what it is people are living in. He should be strong in the word, so we teach Greek and Hebrew. We teach classes on how to translate. Um, we teach classes on how to preach. Um, and, then, and then doctrine classes. That's why, as I was part of the system, I got a Bachelor of Arts yeah. Before I went to the Divinity Seminary School. Right. And to, to what you just said. So it, it could be that we, there, there may be better ways for us to do it. I mean, that, that would always be arguable. That's fine. But it should be that at the point that we have pastors standing around a man laying hands on him to place him into the office of the public ministry, they're able to say, this man has been well trained. And, and I'm confident in that I'll put my hand on his head as a, as a public marking of that. And, and we do have, uh, I know what Jim and I have talked about this, and I'll end it on this, I, I see the time there, but like there's a track of the Office of Ministry at Concordia University, Irvine, that is, I don't know how to describe it all, I, but, but we do know a past, many of us in here know a pastor trained up in it, that's Pastor Tim Norton out at Navajo Nation. So it's not that it has to be Fort Wayne. In a way, Fort Wayne or St. Louis easily answers the question. If someone says, do you have an young deal from St. Louis? I can say yes, and that answers all the But we can also have a, um, a Pastor Schomburger who is well-trained, even though it happened in a different way than the MDiv, although he's going for an MDiv now. 
We can have a pastor, Tim Norton, who, when I've talked about our Lord's gospel with him, he's very well trained. So, but we better close with that. If you have questions on the past, on the office of pastoral ministry, bring them next week. Let us close with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings that you give to your church by calling men into the office of ministry to speak the word of the grace of Christ, of his crucifixion for all sinners. And we pray that the men that we specifically know now, taking these theological classes, Rob Doty and Mark Schomburger, may have much joy in their studies. Bless us and bless them back in Indiana. In your son's holy name, amen. Thank you.